Many of you heard a couple weeks ago from Dr. Amy Walsh, who is an innovator in healthcare here in North Carolina. With a oh, there's Amy. <laughs> Amy's here. Um, you you not only heard from you get to see her again today. Um, who is a physician who is practicing direct primary care? And so we heard from from Dr. Amy about how that works, how it works for patients, how it works for doctors, logistically how that works. But what we're going to hear about today is some opportunities and how that could work, those cost savings that um, establishing the relationship between doctors and patients, how that might work if you were able to do that for county employees, for state employees, even Medicaid. I mean, imagine that. Um, we have a healthcare innovator, an early adopter of the consumer-driven healthcare model, a fighter for healthcare freedom with Mark Watson, who is our, our guest today. He's the executive director of human resources for Union County. And why that matters and why it's tied into direct primary care is under Mark's leadership in Union County, they have made this direct primary care an option for their their county employees. So he is here today to talk about that aspect of it, the implications it can have, and why we need to really continue to fight for this health care freedom in North Carolina to, to promote these alternative methods that are proving to save money, improve um, the relationship between doctors and patients. So Mark, I'll ask you to come up and I'm going to flip over here again, RestoreHealthCareFreedom.com. All right. Well, thank you so much for that, that introduction. Um, you know, it, it's not often that someone from the government comes to talk about health care and nobody leaves the room. <laughs> okay? Uh, you know, and so I appreciate uh, your interest in this topic today. Um, direct primary care, an emerging solution. I think what I want to do for you today is kind of uh, to frame up uh, how we in Union County got to where we're at today. Uh, it, we didn't just f find direct primary care and said, oh, that looks good and, and, and start making it an option. There's, there's actually a, a, a pretty significant background. So to do that, we have to, have, we have to start with kind of a common understanding about the direct care variations that are uh, in the marketplace today. Uh, Dr. Walsh would fit under the solo practice model, uh, it formed around a, one provider who contracts directly with individuals to provide their primary care services. The multi-location piece, this is what we're doing in Union County. Uh, we've contracted with a direct care organization. Uh, the employer pays the membership fees on behalf of the employees. The employees have access to same or next day care. Uh, their concerns are addr addressed much more quickly under this model than under the current fee for service model that we experience today. And thirdly, uh, there's an affiliate network or a hybrid model that has started to float around out there. This is actually uh, being uh, put in place uh, down in the Louisiana, uh, Texas, Mississippi, Alabama area, um, and it's and it's kind of a it, it is a hybrid between the fee for service model and uh, the direct primary care model, where a physician will only convert a portion of their practice to direct primary care and keep the other portion fee for service. I'm not sure exactly how that's all going to turn out or if there will actually be the type of benefits that we're experiencing out of that model, but, but there you have it. So what's driving the development of primary care? What needs does it meet? Is it a, a sustainable solution or is it just quite frankly too good to be true? Now I'll tell you, when we started, when I started uh, looking into this option, when it was first introduced to me and we started having those discussions, I was, I was down here. It's too good to be true. 
you have to think about the frame of reference from which you perceive uh, health care today and how it's being delivered. So what is driving the development of primary care? I found this very helpful for me to understand where, what the drivers behind the, uh, the development of primary care, um, wh what are they? And so we have this, this fee-for-service model. And these arrows represent the direct relationship between the four primary participants in this model. Now, there are some variations, but you have health plan vendors. You have an employer. And by the way, the employer sponsors a health plan for their uh, employees. And they are the primary payer of this whole model. The employer has a direct relationship to the employee. The employee has a direct relationship to the health care provider and to the health plan vendors. The health care provider has a direct relationship to the health plan vendor. But what's missing in this model? Which group does not have direct access to the other? Employers are not don't have the direct access to the health care providers. So as the payer, you can see that the expectations that may be generated down here, the perceptions are totally different than what happens on the other side of the model. In fact, the employee has a different set of expectations than the employer. So employer, as an employer, I'll speak from the employer point of view, I'm interested more in what the premium rate is, how much is this costing, and is it, a, is it a, you know, what kind of value are we receiving in terms of a health plan that we're providing to our employees? The employees, they have a different set of expectations. They're looking at affordability, but they're also looking at, is this a meaningful uh, uh, health care benefit? The employee also has expectations of the health care provider in terms of how accessible are they, how available are the services, how affordable are the services, and are they receiving quality health care. So just in these pieces right here, you see many different types of expectations. Now, what about the health care provider? I had an interesting conversation with a, a physician earlier in the week and we were talking about this model and he said Mark I don't work for the employee I don't work for the employer I work for the health insurance company I work for multiple health insurance companies and I'm contracted with them and I, th I, th I thought wow that's you know I knew that but it was really interesting to hear that verbalized um, so the healthcare provider has a different set of expectations. So until, you know, this all works great until expectations start not being met. Premium rates rise until they're unacceptable. Health plan benefits are restricted or health plan access is restricted or quality of care goes down. And then you can see that expectations are not being met and it just it from an employer standpoint when you're you're paying the bill that's that's you know some of those things are not not uh, they're just just not acceptable so what do you do about it what are your options and that leads us to the question there has to be a better way there has to be a better way and Union County reached this place where we had to make this statement and I had to make this statement uh, you know there has to be a better way so how do we begin addressing unacceptable health plan costs and diminishing health care coverage well let me take you on a quick trip back in time and and I'm going to try to frame this for you in terms of the time frame and the sequence in which uh, we developed our program all the way up through direct primary care. So prior to 2003, we were on the HMO PPO train 
uh, and we were changing carriers every 12 months. It was like a revolving door. You can't have a sustained program and you can't hope to impact your overall quality of care or cost of care if you're on a 12-month cycle with a, with a carrier, whether you're self-funded or fully insured. It doesn't matter. You have to get off of that train sometime. So in 2003, Union County made that strategic decision to get off of the, the, the crazy train. And uh, we actually developed a consumer-driven health plan. Now, consumer-driven health plans at the time were a brand new concept. There were two carriers uh, in the United States, one Luminos and the other was Definity. Uh, Union County did not fit into their business model at all, so we could not entice them into letting us buy into their program. So we ended up having to uh, develop our own homegrown consumer-driven health plan. Now, I've listed out some key elements right here of that program, and I don't have time to go through each one of those in detail. I could spend an hour talking about each one of these, but there is a lot of substance right here in this group. And if you uh, currently are a health plan administrator uh, responsible for providing uh, health coverage for your employees, um, you know, and, and, and you, these terms are foreign to you, you need to, you need to uh, invest a little bit of time in looking into those because they are significant cost savers. One, we went to a no-cost generic medication. Uh, for those of you who remember, uh, there was a large carrier in North Carolina back in 2004, at the beginning of 2004, that started making generics available at no cost. That was after our program had come into place. Uh, we eliminated copays. There's a whole story behind why copays are basically a hidden utilization driver uh, and why it, it really does not work in a fee-for-service model. Uh, we implemented graduating deductibles. We expensed, we, we siloed all of our expenses. This became a huge, huge, huge component. You can't hope to manage the cost of your program unless you have your expenses siloed and you know exactly what's happening with those expenses uh, and you can track them uh, on a very frequent basis. We had an embedded health reimbursement account, and of course we went self-funded. This was critical. Our goal was planned sustainability and continuity. Just making a goal for your employer-sponsored employer, employer health plan is important. Uh, I fear too many of us, you know, prior to 2003 and, and some of my colleagues today don't have a goal for their program, therefore it, you know, there's, there's no, they don't know if they're achieving what they're set out, set out, set out to uh, achieve. So this is what we ended up with. Very briefly, you can see the, I call them silos. Preventive care, prescription care, vision care, and then we have all medical care. Graduating deductibles, and we call, I call this the skin in the game portion of the plan where we implemented a small routine medical deductible. The employer comes behind that with a health reimbursement account that it funds for, and then there's a major medical deductible. The employee has the same dollar amount out of pocket invested as the employer up to that point. All claims that exceed that go into a co-insurance arrangement and then of course 100% after that. This model actually uh, turned our per financial performance around on the, on the plan significantly. This diagrams what our cost breakout is. So you can see 50% of all of our costs that are incurred on the plan are major medical, 22% prescription medications, 16% preventive, uh, uh, preventative, preventive and primary care, that'll be uh, important to our discussion later, 2% case management. But notice this, 10% of total cost goes toward administration 
and stop loss insurance. Um, so 90 cent of every premium dollar provides uh, prescription medication and health care services. Uh, I don't think you're going to find another more efficient plan in terms of the uh, amount of each premium dollar that goes to pay or provide actual benefit services than this program. So, PEPM, what does that stand for? Per employee per month cost. So our per employee per month medical cost increased average 1% annually for the period 2011 to 2015 and for RX is six tenths of a percent. Now those are some pretty low numbers but that's what it's averaged over that period of time. Our current uh, census uh, we cover 1,975 lives. So that's just on consumer driven health. So, you know, as the old saying goes, if it ain't broke, don't fix it, right? So why would we, if we have something that is working like this and we're providing to our employees, why would we even want to mess with it? Well, we didn't. We didn't mess with it for a number of years, not until 2013. So a decade later, we start looking at upgrades, enhancements. Now, we always look at ways to improve the program. There are many, many, many different types of, I'll call them healthcare fads that are out there. This wellness plan, that wellness plan, you know, all of that kind of thing. Many of them have a hard time quantifying their return on investment. It wasn't until 2013 that we really took a look at one component of our program, and that was the, the benefit, I mean the uh, pharmacy benefit. And as a result, we moved that from a traditional, and I'll call it a, a fee for script model, similar to the fee for service medical model, we moved that to a transparent uh, prescription drug pricing model. We moved to a fiduciary pharmacy benefit manager. We changed our entire formulary. Uh, it's an evidence-based formulary now. It's not based off of rebates and incentives and those types of things that come down from the pharmaceutical companies. And by 2013, we had achieved an 85% generic penetration. If you remember back in 2003, we made generics available at no cost. We, within 90 days of doing that, we achieved a 50% generic penetration. Now, why is that even important? That's, that's, I can't even begin to express the, the cost savings to the plan that that one plan design change has made. If a generic uh, medication on average costs you today $50 and that's pretty close to what it's costing and uh, the brand of the same medication costs you $160 and as a plan you know you, your, your employee might pay a $10 copay or $20 copay at the pharmacy counter uh, and you're picking up you know $140 in cost if you could take $140 in cost and you could trade it for a $50 generic medication, that's a winner all day long. And if you could do that times 18,000 scripts, you would reduce the overall cost of your plan by almost $2 million. So between 2003 and 2013, this one generic conversion piece has saved Union County, Union County em, as an employer, and Union County tax player, payers uh, well over $10 million. Well over $10 million. 2014, we made another enhancement and we went to a chronic condition management program utilizing clinical pharmacists. It's delivering a return on investment of 1 to 1.7 right now. And one of the key elements 
Behind that program is the use of cash incentives. You know, it's all about how you frame the benefit for the employee. How do you get their buy-in? How do you get their engagement? Well, I think everybody knows cash is king, okay? Any kind of incentive is going to cost you as an employer. So why not make it something that gets people's attention? Would me reducing their monthly premium, medical premium, get their attention and keep their attention? No, because that's just a number that appears on their pay stub every week and it just, you know, it, it, it's out of sight, out of mind. Uh, but with the cash incentives, uh, we are running somewhere in the neighborhood of a 97% uh, appointment, I don't know what you call it, keeping rate, what would you call that, Larry? Adherence. Adherence. We will adherence. So uh, a 97% adherence, which means 97% of the time the employees that are enrolled in that program are showing up for their appointments with the clinical pharmacist. All of those, those pieces right there have delivered huge dividends uh, into the six figures for, for the plan. Now, again, I'd like for you to imagine, I'm gonna I'm on ask you to imagine a little bit. Imagine if you could spend time in a physician's waiting room if you had direct access to your physician 24-7, 365 days a year, you could spend as much time with your physician as you need, as often as you need. Your experience was meaningful and it improved your health and it didn't cost you any dollars out of pocket. Does that sound too good to be true? Well, yeah, it does. And I'll tell you, the first time I heard it, and for the first couple of months I was in the discussion about this type of program, it still sounded too good to be true. But imagine as, if, as an employer, if you could remove an unpredictable variable in your cost structure, which is utilization frequency, and replace that with a fixed cost, an affordable fixed cost. What if you could reduce your overall medical and prescription drug spend? And what if your plan participants uh, would spend significantly less for their health care? You know, a lot of times, going back into the consumer-driven piece, when we were developing that program, you know, too often employers focus only on what's it costing me as an employer, what's it costing me as an employer, and we don't spend enough time really studying the impact it has or our decisions have on the plan participants. You know, as an employer, as a local government employer, we have a fairly low annual compensation rate. I guess that's a, a fair way to put that. How, how can we layer in increasing deductibles and cost on employees and their families that takes a significant amount of their disposable income. And it, it, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense at all. But if you can imagine these things, then you can begin to understand the benefit of adding a direct primary care option into an employer-sponsored health care plan. So what does that look like? This is how we did it. Okay, now to be clear, Union County offers its employees two options. We continue to offer the consumer driven health option with the deductibles and the HRA just like you saw a minute ago. But we, now we op, uh, offer this direct primary care option. And with direct primary care, as you've seen in other presentations and you've, you've heard, Direct primary care, um, if it's part of a, an employer program, it has to be capped or surrounded by a major medical component. So 
the way we have our program structured, it made it incredibly easy for us to unplug all the deductibles in the HRA and plug in the direct primary care component. So what does, that, what does it do when, what's the impact when you unplug deductibles? Well, that's automatically money that's not coming out of your employee's pocket. When you unplug an HRA exposure on the employer side, what we've done is we've actually redirected the dollars that we would normally be paying for that into the direct primary care piece and it pays for itself almost dollar for dollar. So it's an incredibly efficient transaction for us to be able to unplug some components and plug in direct primary care. Okay, so what are the defining elements of the program? In our case, all care is provided by board certified family physicians. There are no, I will say this, and I think it's a good opportunity to, to say it. There are a number of programs that are currently being marketed and talked about that uh, are more of an acute care type clinic, uh, urgent care type clinic, a wellness type clinic that are utilizing uh, providers that are not board certified family physicians. The board certified family physicians in the direct primary care model is critical. The relationship between the patient and the primary care physician is key to the outcomes, lowering cost, and believe it or not, the patient experience. These physicians operate outside of fee for service arrangement, so they're not a reimbursement arrangement. There's no incentive to deliver unnecessary care. And the physicians are empowered to practice medicine in ways not permitted under the, what I call the production time constraints of a fee-for-service model. And as we went through and we were looking at this as a model to introduce to our, our health plan, uh, not only did the the elements seem too good to be true in terms of accessibility to the physician and all that kind of thing, but it, it's kind of unheard of that physicians take time to receive phone calls from their patients on their cell phone or that they will, uh, you know, a, a patient will call and send a, a text picture of you know, whatever they, they have their question about to their physician. A good example, we had a, a, an employee that was vacationing on the Outer Banks. Their son stepped on some kind of a sand spur, got it in their toe, and the toe became infected. Uh, the employee would have had to take the ferry back over to the mainland. It would have ruined the, the vacation day and all that kind of stuff, but they text the doctor a picture of the toe. And the, toe, the physician was able to tell them what they needed to do to alleviate the, the pain and, and take care of that until they got back to the mainland. Uh, otherwise, it would have been a wasted day of vacation and a, a lot of expense uh, that was unnecessary. This slide just, again, reiterates some differences between the traditional fee-for-service model and the direct primary care model. The number of patients seen per day under traditional 25 to 30 under direct primary care, 12 to 15. So therefore, there's a lot more time being spent with the patient. Under direct primary care, it's 30 to 60 minutes per appointment. Under traditional fee-for-service, 7 to 10. And the key, major key, is the patient panel size. Every, every physician I've talked to recently tells me their patient panel size is between 2,500 and 3,000. Direct primary care model, between six and 800. How can you have a personal relationship or know who a person is and provide them with the kind of care they need if you don't even know who they are? Here, there, there's no chance to know who they are. Here, it's all about reestablishing a working personal relationship with a patient. All right, so now I'm going to get into some results. 
So we began this April 2015. Our plan year runs July 1 to June 30th each year. So these numbers are based off of the third quarter results, the end of third quarter results, and I've annualized them. So when we're looking at medical only plan expense, and we look at two categories, the direct primary care participants compared to the consumer driven health care uh, healthcare plan participants, our DPC participants incur 38% less medical expense to the plan. That's $313.28 per employee per month. That's huge numbers. So when you annualize that, it's a million four oh eight. So another way to think about that is if DPC did not exist at all in our program and all the participants were on the consumer driven health plan, then I would have to go to the county manager and say, uh, I need to make a budget amendment and we need another million four for our, our program this year. Fortunately, I didn't have to do that and I still have a job. <laughs> so how about for prescription expense? Uh, DPC participants incur 37% less on the RX expense. Of course, that's not as big a bite as the medical expense is $60 per employee per month or $269,000 less. Now how about this slide? Out of pocket expense. Okay? The, uh, how many, I mean, it, isn't the, the whole debate in our country and the discussion about affordable care Affordable to who? Affordable to the people that are paying for it? Direct primary care participants spend 46% less out of pocket than under a traditional fee-for-service consumer-driven health plan. So you're looking at $74.23 a month per employee per month. And for all of the direct primary care participants, that annualizes to $313,000. So what does that really mean? So you take a uh, I'll tell you what, take a, a brand new deputy sheriff making $35,000 a year. This is the equivalent of giving that person a 2.5% pay increase on their compensation because they're keeping that money in their pocket. Self-reported health improvements. 73% of the DPC participants report significant improvement made in their overall health since electing the DPC option. Why is that? Um, we believe it's because the average participation goes up, that direct access to the physicians, the participants are averaging 3.1 visits per year compared to consumer driven health, which is averaging 0.6 visits per year per employee. And for those participants in the direct primary care option that have chronic conditions, their visits are averaging right now 5.5 uh, yeah, visits per year. So, I have to ask myself a question. If the average direct primary care physician, or participant, excuse me, participant is going to the physician 3.1 times per year, you would presume that they're going because they need care. They're getting what they need. But what about these? Why are they not going at the same rate as the direct primary care participants, what are the barriers that are keeping them from being with their family physician the same amount of time? Is it financial? Is it limited access because the physician doesn't have appointments 
uh, in their schedule? Uh, is it the availability of the health care? Well, what is it? And can you imagine? I mean, this is, on, this is for an average participant. Now, the chronic condition folks, 5.5 times per year, those are the ones that really need the attention. But yet, under consumer-driven health, it's still 0.6. So, there's some, uh, still some questions that need to be vetted out there, but um, it's, a, it's, an interesting, it's an interesting trend. So, direct primary care, is it an emerging solution? I, I, think it's, I think it's more than an emerging solution. I think it's a sustainable solution. Uh, it certainly is for our program. Uh, and uh, with that, I will answer any questions that you may have for me. Got some right here in the back. Yes, sir. Right now, 40% of the employees or the plan, I'll use plan participants because uh, let's just say there's 2,000 covered lives, okay? So 40% of all plan, plan participants have changed or enrolled in DPC. The remainder are still in the consumer driven health plan. That number is changing monthly. We are actually seeing that the, consumer, that the uh, direct primary care enrollment is increasing by 3% per month and the consumer driven plan is declining uh, by 1% a month. So why would, why did they not change? There's a, there were, there's a lot of reasons. Some because they have these, they perceive they have a, a, a good relationship with their primary care physician. Uh, some are, some have chronic conditions and they have specialists and they have this, that, and they don't want to mess up that whole situation. Uh, one of the more interesting uh, issues that we had to address early on was the fact that the father and the mother wanted to go to direct primary care, but they wanted their children to stay with their current pediatrician. And we weren't able to find a solution for that. Uh, but based on word of mouth, based on personal experience from coworkers and things like that, our uh, enrollment of children in the program has swelled. 37% of the total enrollment in DPC are children now, all the way from birth up to their teens. But it's a myriad of, it's a myriad of things. Some people just want to take a wait and see attitude about it. Yes. Well, the, the premium rate under the DPC and under the consumer driven is exactly the same. They're just paying $20 a month for their employee only coverage. But the premiums they pay for their dependents, it doesn't matter whether they're under DPC or consumer driven, they're the same at this point. We did not differentiate in premium because we're underwriting our entire program at least to start with. I mean, we're new into this business, in, into this model too. So we want to underwrite everything as a collective. But what we're, as you can see, in the first year, our cost for consumer driven is much higher than it is for DPC. And that is a trend that, in talking to other employers that have adopted this and have been using it for, mm, I think, three years now, that the differential is becoming so wide that, uh, in fact, I'm thinking of one, one uh, steel fabricator up in, uh, up in the Wisconsin area uh, that the differential between his cost to provide DPC versus traditional has become so wide, he's, he's put his employees basically on notice that they either need to make the decision to do it voluntarily or he's going to have to make the decision for them because they can't continue to you know, have this big differential, it's just not feasible. All right, follow up to that. When your employer goes to the direct primary care physician, do they have to pay a 
No. 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 But the other part is, if this direct primary care visit then gets referred to a specialist, how is that handled? Who pays for that? That's a good question. So, everything that occurs inside the direct primary care office, so everything that a fam board certified family physician can do is all covered under this block. If a person has to go out for uh, imaging, outpatient, inpatient, uh, there's a major lab panel that's not available or not able to be done here, that all would go into a straight 80-20 as long as it's in network, I'm speaking in network. So it'd go 80-20. As soon as they hit their max out of pocket, then they are, their benefits 100%. What's that max out of pocket? $2,000 on uh, employee only. And I think uh, to put that in context, I think the state health plan is like 6,500. Right, Every, everything else. Anything that cannot be done inside the primary care physician's office goes 80-20 or 60-40 if it's out of network, and then it's covered at 100%. Yes, sir? Could you elaborate a little bit more about your cash rewards program and what, what, uh, what were some of the challenges that you saw and then what has been really successful with that? Okay, cash reward. Whoop. I hit the wrong button. So cash rewards on the uh, chronic uh, condition piece. So there's a couple of different things that have to happen there. Um, one, in using the clinical pharmacist, uh, they have to gather information. There's a health risk assessment that has to be filled out. There's uh, information that the patient or the, the participant has to provide. So what we, in, what we do is they fill out the health reimbursement, uh, the, the, the health risk assessment, and they provide the pharmacist with all the other documentation they need, and they get a $40 Visa card. Then for every time they come back, let's say based on their condition, the clinical pharmacist needs to see them every 30 days. So every 30 days they come back, they keep their appointment, and they have done everything that has been set out for them as a goal. They have, they have engaged, they have participated, they have done their part, then they get a $20 uh, Visa card, okay? If they don't have to see, be seen for three months and they come back and they've had more things that they were supposed to do during that 90-day period, then it would be a $60 Visa card. The, it, 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 it's cash money, and cash money motivates, you know? And uh, the cost, I mean, the, when, I, when I showed you the, the, the return on the investment, 1 to 1 1.7, that includes the, this cash incentive. That's a part of the cost of the program. So, and I want to point out, we have Larry Long with us today, and Larry's group, uh, Piedmont Pharmaceutical Care Network, is the group that's providing uh, that clinical pharmacist uh, service for us, and Larry also acts as our independent pharmacy review. He reviews all of our pharmacy claims, makes recommendations for an evidence-based formulary, and, and those types of things. So he, he is our third-party watchdog as I'll, I'll frame it. Yes, sir. Are those cash rewards uh, considered taxable income for the, for the As long as they're de minimis, they're not. So define de minimis. <laughs> okay, that, that becomes the, the, the constant debate we have with our CFO. If $20 is de minimis, uh, so, I, yes. Uh, talk about one side of the equation where you save money, the employee saves money. Well, that, if you're saving money, that means the provider and the uh, of service and the insurers is making less money. 
Secondly, mm -hmm. Wayne, Wayne uh, Goodwin said the Affordable Care Act may be costing us insurers that are leaving the state. How did that impact you if providers decide to leave? If I, insurers, I mean. Insurers. I, 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 the more established financial institutions called insurers in North Carolina, I don't believe are going to be leaving the state anytime soon. There's too, that the pie is too big. Okay, um, and right now we're just on the front edge of this, all right? But that being said, you know, we, we, as, we as the purchaser of these services have agreed with a provider of these services on a reasonable cost. They, they're, in, they're in business to make money. So they know what their cost expense is. They know what margin they want to make. So we have come to a consensus on what that is. It is, remember when I talked about eliminating uh, utilization frequency, okay? What I'm talking about is eliminating unnecessary medical expense and, and really eliminating uh, the waste of medical services. That's, that's what I'm talking about. Okay. Which, by the way, I will point out, Matt Weissnert and Alan Gibson over here are both with Paladina Health, and they are the provider of our direct primary care program. One more thing. Uh, I noticed on the chart, 22% went to prescription drugs, the first one. And it looked like that was your first issue to address. Was is prescription drugs going up faster than most other courses? Now, actually, in our program, because of the way it's built, which is, which is it's, it's a non-typical model because of the generic, uh, the generic component that we have, okay? okay? And our, our, our penetration being so high, our, our prescription cost is actually going down, due in large part to an evidence-based formulary and, and the work that... Uh, has been done to really drill down into the MAC pricing and some of those other issues. Thank you. Yes. What are your peers saying in the other counties? Are they coming on board? Or is there a lot of there's, a, there's a lot of interest. Um, they, like the employees who have not made that choice yet, uh, are taking a, a wait and see approach. Um, you know, it's not. It, Providing an employer-sponsored health plan is not a cookie-cutter process across the state of North Carolina. Okay, so everybody has their, hopefully has their own goals, objectives, and what they're trying to achieve and what's acceptable to them as an employer. You know, for us, we reached the unacceptable level back in 2003 when something had to give. Something had to give, and we had to, we had to engage more as an employer at that point. Yes. I have a question. Do the, do the employees have any pushback against having a non-acute network of providers to choose from? If they've got a direct doc, I can imagine there's lots of direct docs to choose from. So do they ever say, oh, I only have one choice, or two choices? They know, they know right up front that they, we have two physicians, a male and a female. Okay. Um, they, know what they're, they know what they're signing up for ahead of time. We actually, which is a really neat, you know, piece because the doctors have been in more engaged with the employees and the employer. They actually come to our, we'll call them info sessions. They provide uh, lunch and learns like this one, you know, to our employees. They did one on men's health not long ago and the room was packed, which I was like, that's the first time that's ever happened. So, you know, there's a lot more personal interaction and that goes back to the establishing or reestablishing that relationship between doctor and patient. Well, that's like a sure. Just I mean, you know, I have reason to go from time to time to the physician's office and it's the strangest thing because uh, our company also has pharmacists that have been a lot of medical practice. We walk in that medical practice.
necessary, I think, administrative things cut out because one receptionist, it, it looks like it's, uh, it looks like they've opened on Saturday just to see if anyone's coming. Well, it, it, the, the reactions that we are getting is uh, from not only our employees but their family members is that it doesn't feel like a physician's office. They don't even, it feels just like they're visiting with a friend and that's the atmosphere that the, that the, the office has taken on. Uh, one, uh, the nurse the other day told me that there was a little boy that was in, in uh, to be seen and it, the appointment was over and he asked his mom, you know, do we really have to leave now? You know, when's that ever happen, right? So I would also like to point out some other folks in the room that, that are instrumental in what we do. Um, Corinne Lorenz is with Integra BMS. Uh, they are actually our claims processor for our entire program. Uh, case management is a big part of what they do. Um, I think they do case management better than anybody. Uh, we get some fantastic reviews off of our employees uh, for case management. And we have Bill Webb and Bill Webb uh, with NFP. Uh, and, and I have to, to uh, uh, give both of them credit for actually introducing this direct primary care topic along with transparent pharmacy pricing and, and uh, some other things to us. Uh, and they actually become my debate partners, <laughs> I guess you could call it, because we have some incredibly long discussions about why is this working, why will it work, why won't it work, what makes it work, you know, all of those types of things, but uh, they've been instrumental in the, in the whole process. Yes, sir. I wanted to know with their uh, uh, dental and optical benefits with your program. Yes, uh, dental, dental we operate as a, a totally separate uh, standalone program, um, but that is available as part of the, the piece. Optical, what we end up doing with optical, uh, it's a standalone expense silo. There's a capitated benefit to that, but it's available. Yes, sir. Have you looked at this operating in concert with or as an ACO or in that environment? I have not. I have not. Yeah. Let's take the spinal to the Okay. Yes, sir. In your, the process to get to this direct primary care, did you ever look at the health savings account along the way? I think it can be offered by private corporations. I don't know about public. Or, uh, where, is that like a fossil now? Or, well, uh, you know, we, when we were, we were one of the early adopters on the consumer-driven side, and, and health reimbursement accounts had just come out. And so we incorporated the health reimbursement account to that, and, and that's an employer-funded piece that the employer retains ownership of. Um, health savings account, I believe it was about 24 months after that, in about 2005 actually came out. Um, we've never incorporated that into our model. Uh, we felt like that the benefit that we had structured around the consumer-driven piece really um, did not make it necessary for us to add on additional expense that would then become owned by the employee at that point. So we, we, we chose not to go that way. Okay. Nobody else is going to ask. Okay. Point of, point of clarification. Sure. When your employee has a prescription, do they take it to any pharmacy they like? Absolutely. Absolutely. It's a it it's an open network. It's a really neat really neat feature. We have one one quest can we get that one right back the regular? That's a very good question. We, we have been looking at that, and based on a, on a, a claims, paid claims basis, uh, about 50% of our, and I'll term high claims, claims over $50,000, uh, are coming from both sides of the coin. So they're both from DC uh, direct primary care and from the other. 
Um, 50% 50, 50 of the DPC enrollment or enrollees have at least one, one chronic condition. 26% have two or more. So. posted on the locker room, what, next two, three o'clock, something like that this afternoon. Um, so please feel free to forward those to perhaps county commissioners, other decision makers, other people in your counties who might be interested in taking advantage of what they've done in Union County. Mark, yep. thank you so thank much. Thank you so much. Appreciate it.